Hi, I'm T.S. Kelso, and I'm the Operations Manager for the Space Data Center. And today I'd like to talk to you about the data implications for space traffic management with the coming new space activity. So I want to start off with a brief overview. And first, we're going to start with some definitions because I think it's important to understand what we're talking about when we say new space. And then we're going to run through a couple of case studies where we look at some of the things that are either already happening with new space or will be happening in the not too distant future. And for each of those, we'll look at the associated implications for a variety of things, but primarily the focus being on data management and, and analysis with that data. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through some opportunities that we have in the area of uh, space situational awareness to help with uh, space traffic management with these coming changes. So what is new space? Well, we've all seen it, right? So it's new actors bringing major changes to the way we use space today. And we're seeing things like more launch providers and increased launch rates. We've seen that particularly with things like CubeSats where we've had launches with as many as 104 CubeSats on a single launch. But now we're starting to see a, a tempo of launch deployments for these large LEO uh, communication systems that are designed to provide internet from space. And so we're talking about constellations by SpaceX with their Starlink, uh, OneWeb, and Amazon's Kuiper project. And as, as we see that, we're seeing also large deployments right now for Starlink, where we see as many as 60 satellites being launched at a time, and often uh, only a couple of weeks in between those launches. And along with that, we're starting to see more and better sensors being deployed around the world, and in particular, sensors that are being provided by commercial organizations rather than uh, governments that uh, might restrict the use of that data. And, and particularly when we say new space, we're talking about changes of orders of magnitude, and we're gonna look at some of those changes and, and the actual implications next. So the first thing I wanna do is, is look at a case study where we look at some of these uh, instances where we have more satellites being used to do missions that we used far fewer in the past. And the first one is in the area of Earth resources or remote sensing, where we've gone from situations where we might have had a handful of satellites or maybe even a few dozen to now having hundreds of satellites in individual constellations. And so Planet has already launched over 250 uh, 3U CubeSats. 150 of those are, are still active. Uh, Spire is up to 89. And so we're, we're seeing this population explosion in the amount of data that we collect in this area. And that improves um, the, uh, the timeliness of the data that we get in those areas. But the one that I think a lot of people are starting to talk about more and more is this area of communications and internet access from space. And, and the current situation is that we have, you know, a number of applicants, and I'm just showing, you know, the four biggest ones here right now based on their applications. But we currently have applications for over 107,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. And to put that in perspective, today we have about 6,000 satellites in Earth orbit and only half of those are active, so about 3,000. And we're talking about constellations that have easily 10 times that much. And, and note that while these are applications and we don't expect all of them to be successful, 
or even the business cases to be successful, we would expect that we're still going to see at least an order of magnitude increase in the number of satellites that we have in low Earth orbit. And so I, I'll point you to a uh, video that we put together back in December, and this gives you a sense for how quickly some of this is changing, but we put together an assessment based on those applications to show the growth of, of the population of these types of satellites in low Earth orbit over the next 10 years. And that was in December, we only had about 50,000 applications. So it's actually doubled in just a few short months. And I'll give you a hint, the uh, screenshot that I'm showing here is not the 50,000 applications. It's, uh, it's a really staggering picture of what we expect to be going on in, in Earth orbit. And so what are some of the applications when we have these types of growth in the satellite population? Well, so we already mentioned that we have these, these large deployments and those deployments can tax the way we perform SSA. Remember, particularly for the US government systems, these systems were designed decades ago where nobody had any clue that we would be launching satellites more than one or two at a time, certainly not 60 to 100 at a time. And so when you get a cloud of objects that suddenly gets deployed, like Starlink, where they literally just push out a set of uh, 60 satellites not connected, and they just float apart, you can see that we're going to have all sorts of issues with that. So we have to separate the observations into track so that we can allow good orbits. And if we don't put the observations with the right tracks, obviously the orbits aren't going to be very good. And then trying to associate objects or future observations with the track is going to become increasingly uh, difficult to do. And then, of course, the next thing you need to do is try to identify each of those objects by associating a track with operator information. And that assumes that there is operator information available. And so we, uh, we do have a way to handle this right now. But uh, with, without that, uh, the current process, so we just had a Starlink launch I'm recording this on August 10th. We had a Starlink launch on August 7th that deployed another 57 Starlinks and two uh, co-shares on that mission. And we've seen that it takes, you know, seven to eight days before 18th Space can work through this process of just trying to get tracks that are good enough to publish data and put it out in the public catalog. And so meanwhile, we have, in, in, we have situations where operators may be unable to communicate with their satellites to do basic early orbit operations, and that can jeopardize mission assurance. Now, we actually have a way to do that today, and it, it's just one of the limitations that the uh, current legacy hardware and software at 18 Space isn't really set up to handle, but we can get data from those operators that are able to independently track their satellites that will help with uh, providing good orbits and also uh, positively identifying which object is associated with which track. So that's there. there is an option to, to work through that, but we still got a lot more work to do as that continues to evolve. And of course, as we continue to put more payloads in, into orbit, that's gonna require a lot more work on conjunction assessment. So we would expect that the number of conjunctions is probably gonna go up you know, by at least the square of the number of objects that we have up there in orbit. So if we go from a current catalog of about 26,000 objects and then add another, let's say 50 to 100,000 objects on top of that, we would expect to see an explosion in the number of conjunctions that would be uh, detected. And of course, there's all sorts of issues with that. Uh, 
obviously this is going to challenge the entire approach that, that we use today to do decision making for this type of work. And uh, the computational resources are going to be stressed. And we've got to move beyond what we do today with uh, distance based or probability based metrics to some type of risk based me metric to help operators focus on how to approach this. And so we should be doing that to assess not only safety of flight, but preservation of the space environment. So now we got more sensors. The space fence is supposed is already operational and is supposed to be providing data into the public catalog sometime this summer. We don't know when that might actually happen, but it, and that's supposed to track objects down to two to five centimeters. We have commercial sensors now like ExoAnalytic with 250 telescopes worldwide doing geo. ISON's got over 100 doing the same thing. And Leo Labs is coming online with S-band radar, radars to track objects down to two centimeters. So we've seen this before. This is the current space surveillance network. For things like geo, we notice that there's only three uh, optical sites around the world, and then we have space based support, but that isn't really on the same par as having hundreds of telescopes on the ground that can perform the same type of task. So, what are we looking at today? If we, uh, if you click on this, you can load the uh, orbit visualization tool on Celestrac, and you can get a sense for what that population looks like today. So, um, so we can we can see everything all the way out to geo, and get a sense for just how bad the situation is. Where green are active satellites, orange are dead satellites, and red are all the rocket bodies that we have up in orbit. And you see, you know, things like this. It's planet uh, doing their thing around Earth. It's actually visible you know, all the way out here past GEO. And then you can see these other uh, trains going by that are the SpaceX constellations. So we're looking at going from, for just for LEO from 18,000 objects to over 200,000 if we get down to two centimeters. And that that just causes all sorts of issues. I mean, we're gonna have problems, particularly if space fence is the only sensor with track custody. Uh, we're not going to be able to perform OBS correlations for the other objects that can't be seen from uh, the different sensors around the world. These increased number of conjunctions that are going to now be visible have all been happening, but it just adds another type of data overload to the system. And so uh, we, we want to move to a risk-based metric in doing that, that type of calculation. So we, uh, we know the catalog is going to go above 100,000 objects. Uh, we tend to use right now fixed field formats like TLEs that cannot handle that. And that means we have to change those formats. We have to change the software. Uh, and there's going to be all sorts of problems with legacy software and hardware involved in that. And so we've been working to lead the effort to remove that five digit limitation and at the same time, fix Y2K issues. And I'll point out that we have a link there to uh, additional information on that process on Celestrac. So what are, what are some of the opportunities? Well, there's a lot. So we know that SSA is the foundation for good space traffic management. We've got an increased need for optimized observation collection strategies. Uh, we've got to find ways to more efficiently do computations for orbit determination and conjunction assessment, find better ways to improve track correlation, and then significantly improve decision-making support tools by the application, hopefully, of things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so that was a quick run through 
But uh, at this point, I'll leave it open for questions. Thanks.